Welcome to Color Me Dead. This is a true crime podcast, and we talk about murder and fuckery most foul in detail while using the darkest of humor. If you don't like words like fuck and cunt, then you probably shouldn't listen. But if you do, then join us while we fuck your feelings. Two, two brief seconds. Um, I'm not going to talk about it today, maybe another day. I just wanted to say thank you guys for your patience um, while I have been out dealing with stuff. And um, thank you for being patient. Thank you for all the well wishes, for the tots and pears. All the tots and pears. All the tots and pears. Um, maybe on a later so-sode, I'll uh, talk about it a little bit. But just so you know, I think that the hoidest poet is done. So. Yeah. My father has been, and my father did pass away. His funeral was very beautiful. And... Now we just have to empty the house and go through some stuff. But anyway, thank you guys. We're back on track a little bit. We are going to take, like, we're going to try and pound out a bunch of episodes to, like, put out for you so that we can still take Christmas off. Um, My dad, inconvenient as ever, decided to die right before we were (laughs) doing holidays. But, you know. before we're going to take a holiday break. So, well, December's going to be... Whatever, like you get what you it'll get. It'll be a surprise if we have an episode. <laughs> Y'all if, get what yeah. you get. So we'll try to keep it consistent. If it doesn't happen, we'll see you in fucking January. But I keep I had this whole thing planned to say, and then I forgot it. Oh, I was gonna sing to you. Guess who's back? Back again. Who? Gory gals. Oh, tell to, a friend to fuck your feelings. Oh, and I certainly dived in a little. Deep. So fuckish. So, so fuckish? Your feelings have reversionized themselves, so we're going to get rid of that. You're we're just going to we're gonna let you know that the next few episodes, Um, so what happened, see what happened was, I was reading a book and getting a, a series, like a like three, four parter put together. And <clears throat> while I was, and I'm not going to tell you who it is. Because those are next. But Surprise. Surprise. Um, so as I'm like Googling different things for that case, I came across a handful of other ones. Now, I know that you guys, like nobody, nobody loves it when I do this. However, the reason that I'm doing these specific ones is because there are actual laws and there are actual alerts and there are things that are tied into these cases that I think you guys should be aware of. And I think it's important for you guys to know this. I think that it raises awareness for the Good Samaritan I really just... Thing. I, I think... I realize, you know what, um, in the grand scheme of things, I know that the Good Samaritan law can be tricky. You know what I mean? Like, we are not required to perform CPR. We are not required to jump in feet first and get in the middle of shit and save people. Um, I feel like I would in certain cer- certain circumstances. However, I'm not going to put myself in a position to be... Um, permanently disabled or possibly die to help somebody else mm-hmm. because I have people that rely on me. You know what I mean? Like right. my mom alone is a reason for me to like, I will call for help. I will do the best I can, but I can't run into a burning house. Right. You and, know what I mean? And unless it, there's puppies. Yeah. I'm just kidding. Well, in this case, I think that just calling, tipping, letting people know. Uh, in this one, why, I probably would but... have gone to fucking jail. I would have, Uh I would have 100% gone to jail, uh, and you'll find out why here shortly. Um, so without further ado, if you guys want to find us on social media, you can do so on Twitter at Color Me Dead Pod, Instagram, Color Me Dead Podcast, Gory underscore Nikki, and Color Me Dead Angel. Facebook, we have the Color Me Dead Podcast page. We also have the Color Me Dead Podcast group. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. With all the factory most fail. You can find us on ageofradio.org slash color me dead. It has all of our episodes, a link to our Patreon. It has all of our uh, affiliate, sponsors. Yeah, affiliate sponsors. You can find all kinds of shit. You can find other shows that are on our network, which are, are some, there's some good shows on there. Um, you can also, like I said, while you're on there, donate to our Patreon, or you can go to patreon.com slash color me dead podcast or you can just go to patreon.com search color me dead podcast we have tiers from one dollar to 75 dollars you can donate to you get anything from stickers to hoodies for your patreon perks 
You get them after you have been a Patreon for 90 days, but from the very beginning, you get ad-free episodes as soon as they are finished. I upload them on there first. We get them up, you'll upload it. Uploaded. Um, and there's some new new things coming out after the first of the year for Patreons only. 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 At patreonsonly.com. <laughs> uh, <if> you, <laughs> you don't have to feel lonely. At Patreon only. Do I quote? Do I quote? That's not a real thing. Uh, no, it's not. Uh, if you guys want to check out merch, you can get every sort of everything under the sun if you want to go to callingmedeadpod.threadless.com. Um, yeah, if you want some, some, whoa, if you want some merch but don't want to donate to Patreon every month, that still gives us a little bit of a kickback too if you order some of our merch. But you're also repping us, show us off. Yeesh. Take us with you. Put it on your chest. Say it with your chest, little loud bitch. If you want to send us some shit, which we got a very nice Christmas card I forgot to tell you about from Shay, Kristen. Aw. Shay. Thank you. All the names that we call her, you who has a million names, thank you for your Christmas card. It's very beautiful. She (laughs) who wrangles rabbits. Yes. uh, It was from Dinah, too. Anyway, back at the ranch. So, yeah, if you want to send a shit like like she did, you can do it to P.O. Box 1610, Vernal, Utah, 84078. You can email us anything you would like. Rather, I prefer not to have dick pics. Color Me Dead Podcast. No. Color Me Dead Podcast at gmail.com. Dick pics will all be reposted with your real name. All right. So, episode 124, I'm just here to fuck your feelings. Sorry. Sorry. Not sorry. Now, like I said, I'm fully aware that a lot of you guys struggle with the murder of children. And trust me, it's not a subject that I jump to cover. It's not like I, I, I don't like these the most. But what we all need to know is that these young people, the young and the meek, they often don't have a voice of their own. And their cries for help while being harmed are going unnoticed. Mm-hmm. And too often their abusers and murderers are being, uh, they're being released far too soon like hello baby brianna's mom got a whole new fucking identity and got to go like she got to restart her fucking life somewhere which isn't fair no it's not because i really think that fucking horrible bitch needs to die in a fiery car crash so today i'm here you know just to fuck your feelings like you do Mm -hmm. so i'm going to start with a beautiful little girl who was named elisa She was born in Manhattan, New York, February 11th, 1989, to a Cuban father and a Puerto Rican mother in Wood Hill Hospital. Gustavo, her her dad, had immigrated from Cuba, hoping to become a dance teacher. Her mother, is it a Wilda? A Wilda. A Wilda, Mm -hmm. was a native New Yorker who had been raised in Brooklyn. The pair met in a homeless shelter. Gustavo had been employed by the shelter to help with um, catering, cleaning, and maintenance. Awilda had been a temporary resident at the shelter since her and her previous party partner, not party, did not make rent. The inability to pay rent was in large part because Awilda's crack cocaine addition. Addition. Like, addition. <laughs> I've been doing too much meth. Addiction, like you do. Um, Awilda had two other children from this partner, Ruben. Gustavo and Awilda would meet two years before Alyssa was born. The relationship was brief and Gustavo reportedly ended the relationship because Awilda's continued drug use. She had lost custody of her other two children in 1989, Rubencio and Casey, who were given to her family members who expressed concern for her growing addiction. When she was pregnant with Alyssa, she was still using. It goes without saying that because of this, Alyssa was born addicted as well. The city's child welfare was notified of Alyssa's condition and Gustavo was awarded full custody of Alyssa. While the Cuban man had zero parenting experience, he took to the task with no questions. He was a loving, doting father who, who took parenting classes, sought advices from his friends and family, to best care for his tiny daughter and was the head of every celebration for Alyssa's for Alyssa from her birthdays to her baptism. Yes. So he hit the ground running. He was like, okay, I have this baby. What do I do? You know what? I 
take classes. Let's I learned do this, so which he, is a lot more than a lot a lot of parents that you know. Right, it's a lot more than a lot of parents. So he <clears throat> he went out, took parenting classes. Not only did he learn like how to properly swaddle, how to change her diaper, um, because there are things that you can get away with with baby boys that you can't get away with ba- with baby girls For with real. diapers. Okay. Yeah. Um, there's there I mean there was a ton of things like how how to properly bathe her, how to dress her, how to burp her, all of that. People that were close to them said that Alyssa's Alyssa was her father's life and he constantly boasted about his little princess. And if this story had a happy ending, we would leave you here and that is not the case. Oh. While Gustavo had primary custody of Elisa and was doing everything he could for her, he was experiencing some health issues. In 1990, Gustavo had enrolled Elisa in the Montessori preschool and was determined to make sure that she received the finest education. Sadly, Gustavo's health issues kept him from earning the wages that he needed to keep Elisa in school. The teachers and the administrators were determined to help the father and daughter because of his dedication to her and the fact that Elisa was such a promising youngster. The school introduced Elisa to one of their patrons, Prince Michael of Greece, in 1993. When Elisa was introduced to him, she leapt into his arms and stayed by his side all day. Seeing the charm and the promise of this youngster, Prince Michael felt compelled to pay for all of her schooling at a private institution, the Brooklyn Friends School, until 12th grade. This man, who clearly had money falling out of his orifices, was like, yeah, okay, this one, I will pay for her all the way through. Um, Alyssa and Gustavo accepted the gift and the little girl would write handwritten letters to the prince to say thank you. The prince and Alyssa kept in contact during her short life with letters and drawings and gifts to her from him. You couldn't resist that smile. Alyssa always clung to people. She had so much love, recollected one of her teachers, Barbara Simmons. That same year, Awilda was given a permanent accommodation in the housing projects in the Lower East Side. A social worker had signed an affidavit that she had, quote, successfully beaten her addiction and was confident in returning her child, her children to her. On paper, it would look like Awilda was on the up swing and that she was wanting her daughter in her life. So my my question, <clears throat> not really even a question, it's more, it's more the, you know, I think it's the lack of knowledge um, about addiction, but to sign an affidavit that says you successfully beat your addiction, like, you know, a a traveling Bible salesman showed up, she praised Jesus, he stuck the holy water in the Bible on her, you're healed. That is not the way fucking addiction works. No. That is not how it works. So discussing her, her situation, um, I, I just, I really feel differently about this case because there were people in charge, people of authority who were like, oh yeah, she's, oh, she's fine. You know, this girl, she's on the up and up. She's on the upswing. My thing is with, with a lack of knowledge about how addiction works, do you think that this person really genuinely believed that Awilda had beaten her addiction or was it more along the lines of like, yeah, yeah, she's fixed. Like, Get her off paper. Get her out of my office. No kidding. And what I'm going to say sounds horrible, but I don't know how else to say it. And I'm not trying to be a dick at all. Okay. Um, But you don't know if somebody's completely beat addiction until their life is over. If if throughout their the rest of their life they continue to not, you know, if you didn't didn't go back, then they beat it. But after how long? Yeah. Not very long. I don't. I don't know. Maybe I'm just like a little (laughs) gun shy here, but I just really think that, um, I don't, I don't buy into the, you're, you're healed. Mm -hmm. I think people no longer, how do I say this? She's not in active addiction. She's not in active addiction. She's not. Um, and that doesn't make it like some people white knuckle their way through recovery. Some people don't. Some people express that they're no longer, um, it depends on the person, but a lot mm-hmm. of people will express that they are in recovery. I'm not an addict. I'm in recovery. A lot of people will say that they're an addict for life, and that's okay. But I think it's really reckless to sign a fucking paper. To say she beat her addiction. To say she is 100% I-okay. So with that, um, with the social workers, do you know how often they would come and 
check on her? Like, well, we'll we'll get into that okay, a little bit sorry, more. I no, you're okay. Remember. You're totally good. So, um, yes, I do, and it wasn't enough. And so, my question is, if in the event that uh, a social worker signs an affidavit saying this person is all better and they should have their children back, should they be charged with negligence? I think so, because who does that? Like, I would say they have currently, they are currently not on any substance. Um, We will continue to check up. You know, I would never, I would never sign something saying, yep, they beat it, they're done, fucking let's let's roll let's boogie and i think that she should be held accountable because i am of the opinion that if you like it's one thing to express um optimism for a person that is currently in recovery i think it's quite another to sign an affidavit saying that they're hunky fucking dory the world's their oyster everything is peachy fucking keen and give them kids or access to weapons or, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, for for me, it's a no for me. For me, yeah. I really just think that, like, when the system fails, okay, and you look back at this paper trail of how people got their kids back or had access to certain things, I think the people that signed sealed and delivered them should also be held accountable but that's just me i agree and i'm i'm really just um i'm just of the opinion that like even if it's a negligence charge like you negligently Mm -hmm. signed a document stating that this person was ready and prepared to take on the role of being a parent or what have you that you should then be in question if uh, negligence if anything yeah Um, yeah i I'm with you. And I don't know what treatment looked like back then. No. No, I don't either. Because the way that treatment is addressed now, and I am a big, big advocate of this, um, you know, I I constantly tell people at work, uh, whether I'm dealing with a youth or a parent or whatever, or a coworker that thinks that she knows some shit about some shit and she doesn't, <clears throat> addiction is not a gateway drug. It's not marijuana. It's not cigarettes. It's not alcohol. Mm -mm. Okay. Addiction comes from abuse, trauma, and neglect that are untreated and unrecognized. And it comes from trying to cope with the pain and the the constant, um, I'm just going to call it like, addiction is there. Addiction is a side effect of trauma. Mm -hmm. 100%. So the way that addiction is treated now, um, you know, when they treat the addiction, you're treating the, the, the symptoms of trauma. Um, but a lot of what I didn't realize I was going to be getting in treatment was the fact that they were going to address my abuse and my trauma as a kid. Mm-hmm. Clear up until, you know, uh, being a big kid. And that, in large part, is what keeps me from using, is the fact that I can um, I can communicate and express my emotions and and take care of what bubbles up inside of me. I don't know what their treatment program looked like back then. I have a sneaking suspicion that a lot of it was like, we are going to treat um, your addiction. We're going to get you weaned off the drugs. We're going to detox you. And then we're going to teach you how to balance a checkbook and pay your fucking bills on time. And we're going to give you a place to live and let you yep. be a grown up. And yeah. Here you go. But I really just don't think that... I don't know how well that worked for a lot of people until addiction and treatment center started to address the underlying issue. Why are you using, you know, there are some people that might jump up and down and be like, cause it fucking feels good. And if it feels good, do it, do it. Cause I'm a big firm believer in like, Hey man, it feels good. Fucking do it. But there are a lot of people that use drugs and alcohol to tame shit on the inside. Mm -hmm. And if you're not going to fucking look a person in the eye and address that shit, they're going to keep doing it. Mm -hmm. So. Well, yeah, an addiction with trauma doesn't, doesn't only stick to alcohol and drugs or anything. It's food too. Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of different ways to cope with it. A will that was now married to a maintenance man by the name of Carlos Lopez. 
and was pregnant with her fourth child, a girl who would be born in 1990 named I think Taish. it's Tasha. I think it's Tasha. Tasha or Tasha. Yeah. We don't know. In November of 1991, Awilda was granted partial rights to Alyssa. This included unsupervised visitation every weekend. During these brief but unsupervised visits, Alyssa's siblings would witness abuse, neglect, and trauma on her by both the mother and the stepfather. Yeah, so um, the the brother, Rubensino, Rubencio, however you want to say that, not being rude. Right. That's just a mouthful. So little Ruben and Casey both told relatives what was happening, but nobody took action and the authorities were never contacted. So back at the, back at the, you know, should people be held accountable for their lack of action? Now, this would fall under that Good Samaritans thing. Kind of, kind of, sort of, would it not? Because I thought... I thought that if a little kid came to you and said, I'm getting fucked with, or my brother or sister is getting fucked with, that you then had an obligation, like a legal obligation, not just a moral one, to contact somebody. But I guess that's not true. No, I don't think it is unless you are a doctor or someone. You have to be like doctor, lawyer, teacher, Mm -hmm. counselor, like somebody in a position of like trust and authority with youth. Mm -hmm. So for them to reach out to the family and just be like, yo, my little sister's getting fucked up on a daily basis. But in if there's proof, because I, I know that it's that, that burden of fucking proof. That's a slippery fucking slope to be standing on. Because a little kid could be like, I fucking told you. And, you know, he said, she said. But in, in, my, in my personal, where I sit, where, where I sit on this fence post. Because there are, there were family members that later admitted yeah they did say that but we just thought that awilda was a little bit more um harsh right that well, her sorry go ahead i got all excited because it's like well it's the 90s and not to say that like you do well it is the 90s it is the no, 90s. it was the 90s and you know when it was the 90s we were getting spanked and well sure for stupid shit all the time and it was like well i think until i think it was you know until people had a um, had an idea that like, listen, it is not okay to bust your kid with a fucking belt for 12 licks. Like that is excessive. You know, it is not okay to bust fucking spatulas over your kid and reach for a new one and keep going. Like one, one and done. One Just and kidding. done. If you break that one, you're done. My mom did that to David. That's why God, I laugh about it now. My mom did that to me all the time. Um, and my, David took it like a fucking ass. champ, but that is excessive. Mm-hmm. What my mom did was excessive. Um, you know, she didn't permanently injure us that I'm aware of, you know, but there are things like that shit sticks with you. Um, am I, I, I still believe that it should be okay to like pop your kid on the ass. Right. A or little, a, get a their little, attention. Hey, quit. You need to associate bad behavior with consequences. I just woke my dog up because I do that to her. Sorry. I don't pop She's her. She's like, I didn't do anything. I literally just clap my hands and tell her no. And she just woke up and looked around like, the fuck did I do? Today's uh, podcast, um, what is the word I'm thinking of? Our mascot, mascot is Nuka Nu. Is Nuka. Paloma's outside the door throwing a fit because they like to play too much. Like I can see her little shadow. I know. They just, you play too much and they can't play right. unsupervised because Nuka is still too little. And they're loud or they, they, you know. Well, you get Nuka barking and it's very shrill. Yes, that it is. But what I'm thinking though is that it's the 90s and like, like I said, like we weren't necessarily abused in the 90s. And so they could be like, hey, she gets her, she gets beat, you know, she gets spanked a lot. And they're like, well, that's, that's how we discipline our kids you know, like nowadays it would be like, oh my God, she got beat. I don't know. That's, that's the only way I can make any sense I, of this in my brain. I just think that a lot of, um, I think that a lot of family members turn a blind eye to a lot of things. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, even if, um, you know, what if uncle Billy is like excessive where he takes the boys out to the wood pile and beats the shit out of him. And we're like, but they don't do that again. That was kind of like the, mm-hmm. the mindset, you know yeah. what I mean? So got to take them out, teach them a lesson. They won't do that shit again. But you don't do that again, which guess what motherfucker? I probably will. 
I might do it again. I just won't get caught next time. I'm just going to be, I'm going to be better about not getting caught. So there were adults that allegedly were told by her, her older brothers and nothing, nothing happened. Gustavo, as well as the teacher at Elisa's private school, took notice of the bruises and the behaviors that indicated mistreatment and abuse that Alyssa was, that she was experiencing when she returned from her visits with Awilda. One of the locations of these injuries was Alyssa's genitalia, and the child did divulge that her mother repeatedly hit her and locked her in cupboards, adding that she had no desire to see her mother again. Her father also noted that Alyssa had begun bedwetting in addition to losing control of her bowels and would regularly experience nightmares upon learning that she would be in the custody of her mom even for short periods of time. Another family acquaintance noticed that Alyssa would always vomit upon her return home from her visits and refused to go to the bathroom. Like bathrooms, all bathrooms were... That's a red flag. Yeah. That's beyond, like, just getting spanked. Like, yeah. Dude, if your kid is vomiting, defecating, and urinating on themselves, what the fuck are you doing to them? Yeah, like... And not just, like, if, you're, if your child had bedwetting issues prior or already, like, that's one thing. But to be fully potty trained and then revert back to some of these behaviors, what are you doing to that kid? No kidding. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Gustavo went straight to New York's Child Welfare Administration to report these findings, as did one of Alyssa's teachers. Alyssa herself even confessed to the abuse to a social worker. Her father did apply in 1992 to have Wilda Lopez's visitation rights ceased. However, the courts ruled that the visitation rights w- could continue, albeit with the conditions Wilda must not strike or otherwise harm her daughter. How are they going to... How do you monitor that? Yeah, it's... He, it's he said, she said at this point, or she said, she said, but you know, I mean, if there's, but there's all these things, like even the teacher noticed bruises and shit. And like one of the, one of the areas that was like largely hurt and bruised was her little tiny vagina. This is like, where fuck you, dude. I would probably get in trouble. Cause I would be like, you know what? So they're going to tell her you can still have your visitation. Just don't hit her, okay? I'd be like, oh, fuck you and fuck all of the state of New York. If you think I'm ever going to let my kid go there again, I will not. No, 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 we, no. We no, ain't no. doing all that shit. But then at the same time, it's like, okay, so I get in trouble and I get thrown in jail for keeping my kid away. And she goes there. Yep. So, what? God, that's got to be fucking horrifying. Which, we'll, we'll get past that here in a minute. Um, yeah. So... We don't think that you should abduct abduct children. You know, we don't necessarily condone child abduction, but in this case, I probably would have. I 1,000% would have. Uh, That being said, in a desperate attempt to keep his daughter safe, in 1993, Gustavo had planned to flee the country with Alyssa, returning uh, to his home of Cuba to raise her, which I feel like any, any parent would do the same thing. He formulated his plan and went on to purchase airline tickets for both him and Alyssa for May 26, 1994. Sadly, the illness that had been plaguing Gustavo took took its toll, and he was admitted into the hospital for acute respiratory complications that turned out to be lung cancer. Gustavo... He's because they're... Oh, wait, hold on. Is Kierdo. That word is is Kierdo, died on May 26, the same date that he had planned to travel to Cuba with Elisa. The news of Gustavo's death reached the director of Elisa's school, and she took it upon herself to contact a family judge to express her very serious and grave concerns about the girl's future. Phyllis Bryce told the judge that she and many of the educators at the school feared for Elisa to be returned to her mother. As soon as Awilda knew of Gustavo's death, she took to petitioning to have the custody of Elisa returned to her permanently. She was granted temporary custody of the girl, and the ruling was challenged by a cousin of Gustavo, Elsa Canzanares. She attempted to obtain custody herself, citing the recorded abuse and the neglect of Elisa at Awilda's hands. Both the head teacher of the school that Elisa, that Elisa attended and Prince Michael of Greece also wrote personal 
personal letters to Judge Phoebe Greenbaum opposing the initial temporary custody of Elisa being awarded to Wilda Lopez upon the death of Gustavo and endorsing uh, Elsa Canzaneras as her permanent, like the application to obtain permanent custody of her. Prince Michael made it very apparent to the judge that he had every intention of paying for all of Elisa's upbringing as long as Elsa was going to be her guardian. So he was going to be paying like a monthly support to Elsa, not just her education. Like this little girl would never go without. Yeah. Okay? Um, they all argued that Elisa wouldn't stand a chance if she was placed in the custody of her mother, regardless of the mount- mounting evidence as to why a Wilda was not a suitable mother in 1994. She was in fact granted full and permanent custody of Elisa by judge God. Phoebe Greenbaum, who by the by in 1979 denied a father custody of his 10 year old son, stating that the boy's grandparents were his finger quote psychological parents and that it was a decision that would prove to be fatal for that boy. Um, so, so what does your record look like after this bitch? Um, I'm going to say that Judge Greenbaum may have several lapses in judgment or that she somehow um, had a line of thinking that wasn't very clear. It's unfortunate that her line of work happens to be a judge because she clearly sucks that up. Yeah, she didn't do well. No. Um, so in, this, in, in a case like this, okay, so a judge, should the judge be charged in a case like this for like... Okay, you granted full and permanent custody of a little girl to her mother who had indicated, like she had indicated, she told the social worker she was being abused. She was riddled with bu- bruises. She started bedwetting. She started defecating and vomiting on, like. It's proven. It's like, proven. And you're going to give the kid t- to her? So at at this particular juncture, I really think that a judge who makes that kind of a decision should also face charges of neglect, like gross negligence. I agree. This is the life of a fucking child. This isn't, this isn't just this isn't a puppy that you adopted out to the wrong family. This is a child, and the puppy would be just as bad. But you know what I'm saying? Well, like, let, let's 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 not split hairs. Like obviously, a little girl's life carries more value than a puppy. But I was trying not to leave puppies out. But puppy I do love. I, I I am a I'm a big animal rights person. You know that. Yes, we um, love our puppies. But that was the only the only like, example I could come not, up with quickly. It, it's not a car. It's not a sofa. <laughs> right, it's not a there TV. You, go. you know yeah. what I mean? It's like, not an object that you can be like, well, like a sofa. Like you said, like you it, give a sofa to a shitty family and it gets fucked up. And it's like, well, that's the end of that. Uh, yep. a, a kid is different. Yes. Um, I also for. For myself, and I put this as, I posed it as a question, should this judge have been allowed to continue practicing family law? No. That's two. Well. The two that we know of. Yeah. yeah. Spoiler alert, but it's it's two. And at what point, you know, at what point do you say, hey, you know what? You've allowed kids to go with people twice now. That I'm going to need you to fucking not. Yeah. You, you suck at this. Go. You should, you should do traffic court. <laughs> exactly. Well, and the, the reason, so here's, here's my, my thing. Um, you have now put little kids in the hands of wrong people. And I realize, I realize that in a lot of situations, it's a crapshoot. Like you, you look at a family and they might, for all intents and purposes, look like the perfect family. And then they fucking abuse their child to death. And you're like, holy shit. Yeah. She doesn't have that though. She has nothing good going for her. No, I think that everything, like all signs point to fucked off and that should have been taken into consideration. I wonder if they... They looked at the other kids, though, and were like, well, these kids are fine, so... I don't know. That kid will be fine, but... I don't know, but it's easy for me to be like, fuck you, you get charged with gross negligence, and you don't get to be a judge anymore, give me your robes. But we get to... We get to give our opinion, because... This is what I do. I overthink things, and I make rash judgment and decisions. It's how I get by in life. And everyone goes to the dungeon. And off with their heads. Yes. Lacking the funds to retain representation, which I don't know why Prince Michael... Didn't know about this or didn't Mm -hmm. do anything about it, but Elsa was forced to represent herself in the family court against Awilda. Now, backing Awilda Lopez's application for custody 
were lawyers from a legal aid society and a federally funded parenting program funded by the state Mm -hmm. and the feds. So, according to Elsa, at the hearing, the legal representatives for Awilda testified as her valiant efforts to refrain from relapsing on drugs, falsely claiming that co-workers had visited the Lopez residence and that Elisa expressed a strong desire to live with her biological mother. This, of course, was a fucking lie. Elsa had expressed her desire to never see her mother again to more than one person on more than one occasion. Like... Teachers, and lawyers, social little. workers, her aunts, her uncles, her daddy. Like, she, she's not a 12 year old. She's not a teenager that's like, fuck my mom. I don't want to see her again. Right. She's little. She's How little. old? She's six. Like, yeah, six. She was very little. And for her to have said this to a social worker. Yeah, my kid, my six year old thinks that she should live in my butthole. So for a six year old to be like, no. I don't want to be around my mom, that's a that's a big... That's a big thing. That's a big thing. Well, Awilda's lawyers even went so far to tell the courts, attacking Elsa, that she had some nerve trying to take a child away mm. from her biological mother. Now, to this accusation, Elsa replied her nerve was born out of fear for Elsa being placed with her mother. And rightfully fucking so. Mm. Sorry, I didn't even turn the page because I was sitting there stewing, staring uh, at the page. This is not a this no. is not a, a dig at your appearance, but you literally just sounded like Miss Piggy when she gets angry, and she. <laughs> <laughs> this is not about your appearance. I was like, I know I look good today. You really I'm do look good today. <laughs> I, mm. I only look good when I don't actually have to go anywhere, and you know, like if I have to go somewhere, something looks all fucked up. I have to go pick up Tyler today from Tavasi, where okay. I don't even exit the car. <laughs> I had to look good for that, okay? You never know what single dads are hanging around singing lessons. Awilda Lopez's application to obtain permanent custody of Elisa was approved by Judge Greenbaum in, in September of 1994. As soon as Elisa moved in with her mother, the abuse continued. Elisa was taken out of her prestigious school and sent to a public one, Manhattan's Public School 126. I wonder if that is because she had a bus or something stupid like that. Because why the fuck would you want your kid to go to public school when they have freaking private school paid for for the rest of their goddamn life? I really don't know. Probably because they actually pay attention at the public school and she can continue to... She probably thought she could continue to beat the shit out of her and They don't pay attention. I don't know. Like, I don't want to take a dig at personal school or private... No. Fuck off. Mouth. Come on public school no because i went i attended public school my my entire life but um it was probably a lot to do with the fact that um if she continued to to uh, accept the tuition and whatever from the prince that um like what do they call that correspondence assistance correspondence between the two of them oh yeah would continue she probably had to take her and pick her up from this location in Brooklyn. Um, but most of all, she's got entirely too many hands in her cookie jar when it mm-hmm. comes to Elisa. Mm-hmm. It would be my assumption. Yeah. Yeah, and I I wasn't taking a dig at public school, but I do know the difference between, like, a private school and oh, a yeah. public school. They don't pay as... Well, when you've got a class full of how many children mm-hmm. and you're, re- like, you're responsible for that many kids, and it's not the same in, in private school. You no. know what I mean? It's a, it's a lot different. Yeah. Here she was reported um, as being withdrawn and uncommunicative. She was also reported to be riddled with bruises each week and appeared to have difficulty walking and began to tear out a section of her hair. The increasing concerns of the staff at Public School 126 regarding event abuse, oh, sorry, evident abuse, were also reported to the Manhattan Child Welfare Authorities. See, even public school is fucking reporting it. Right. Reportedly, the Manhattan Child Welfare Authority soon replied to the school that their concerns were not reportable due to the lack of direct evidence of child abuse or neglect. As such, this report was rejected. Upon finding out that the school had reported suspicions of child abuse, Awilda withdrew Alyssa from the school. Mm -hmm. Awilda, by this time, known to have reverted to a regular crack cocaine use, withdrew Alyssa from public school 126 in the spring of 1995. She made no effort to enroll, enroll her in any other school. 
So now Alyssa has nowhere to go to escape her mother. So she's literally stuck with her tormentor 24 hours a day. She would be locked in her bedroom 24 hours, seven days a week. Alyssa wouldn't even be allowed out to use the bathroom and would often defecate in her bed. On March 14th, 1995, an anonymous letter was posted to the uh, Manhattan Child Welfare Authorities. The author of this letter stated that Wilda Lopez had cut off much of Alyssa's hair, had started um, locking her in a dark room for extensive, extensive periods of time. Six days later, Alyssa was admitted into the hospital with a fractured shoulder. The wound had been untreated for three days. I want to know... I want to know why, um, after all of these reports, that she's not getting checked up on by so er, by social services mm-hmm. constantly, even if they're not true, even if they think that they're That's not the... allowed. Why are they not getting checked up on? Mm-hmm. So three days, the hospital was able to determine that the state of the injury had been at least seventy two hours old. I can't believe they they actually took her in. I think the only reason they took her in was to to make sure that something wasn't more severe. Because, now, this is where the really maddening fact. If you're not already fucking pissed off, if you you're not will curious, be now. Let me, let me go ahead and rub some salt on this. Um, Alyssa had court-ordered supervision by a caseworker who was supposed to... Uh, Angel, you mm. really need to fucking... Supposed to... I really need to um, spell and grammar check more. I do that, and I still come up with a bunch of bullshit. (laughs) She was supposed to be doing home and school visits, meaning, Hmm. meaning several, several times a month. Not only was she supposed to come to the home, but she was supposed to go to the school. And if she had been doing her fucking job, she would know that she was no longer in school, and that indicates a rather large fucking issue. And where the fuck was she when the school was reporting it? If you're doing your school visits, Mm -hmm. like the the teacher should have had like your phone number. I know they didn't have email and shit as as frequently as back then, but they should have your phone number. A phone number and an address to get a hold of you. Yeah. Like we had, we had fax machines and shit. There was a way. You could have fucking faxed a motherfucker. I know my mom and dad have one. They use the little piece of shit all the time. Yeah. They're very into that thing. I used to think it was so cool when people had fax machines. I was like, you have one at your house. I know. Really? Let's my my send mom and dad and their fucking, uh, let's send a, a facsimile. Let's fax. A facsimile. A, a facsimile. So my thing is, um, you know, and again, I try to be, I'm talking very loudly into my microphone. I'm angry. I know. I keep I, yelling. Sorry. I, I try to be reasonable. How many cases did the social worker have? How stretched were they? Were they understaffed? Mm-hmm. This doesn't make it okay, but I'm trying to understand why you weren't doing your fucking job. Giving them a little bit of benefit, which I, this is a very child. Little, very this, fucking little. Yeah, this is a child. But if that is your job, if that's your fucking job, do your fucking job. I don't care if you're out there all night. Like if I'm going to be a social worker and my job requires me to never be home to make sure that other little people are okay... Well, then you know what? I'm going to take my fucking dog to work with me. And then I'm going to go home and I'm going to get my husband and we're going to go get some Jack in the Box and then you're coming with me because and it's we're the gonna only... we're going to go do our We're going to go do it together because if this is the only time I get to spend with you, whatever. But she was supposed to be doing court-ordered home and school visits. And I know they weren't being done. I know they weren't. Because if she had gone to the school even one fucking time and an administrator could look her in the fucking eyeballs and say... She doesn't go to school here anymore. Her mom pulled her out. Okay, well then, but then where is she registered to attend? She's not. Issues. So, Awilda had started to tell rel- Oh, God, Jesus. Fuck. Fiergas. Relatives. Give me the goddamn strength. I can't even do my impressions right. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck ass. <laughs> Fuck ass. Fuck ass. Fucking shit. Oh my god, I had Calvin rolling the other day. Sorry, I'm, it's palate cleanser, I guess. I had him rolling because we pulled in somewhere and I can't remember what we heard, but somebody said Raimi. And I was like, shut your fat ass, Raimi. I can't go to the store to buy a pack of smokes without, without running, running into 10 nine guys that you, you fucked. Your yeah. precious what? Your little what? You tell me that fucking cat's name, bitch. 
<laughs> he was rolling. Ugh. He's like crying. I was like, I'm Shut sorry. Shut your fat ass, Rainy. If anybody says Rainy, that is what comes to mind. I think it was like on the radio. Like I, we weren't whatever. even listening to it. I just kind of heard it in the background. And I was like, Shut your fat, fat ass. ass. He was crying. We're like trying to go in the store, but we nope. had to sit in nope. the car and laugh for a minute. Um, it's totally appropriate parenting. It's Hey, it is what it is. He's 12. He can hear that shit. So, Awilda had started to tell relatives that Alyssa was possessed by the devil and that she had been put under a spell by her father. Now, I realize that there's some interesting culture that comes from everywhere. Right. Mm-hmm. But the fact that your family was like, oh my God, did he... <laughs> he put a spell on her? Fucking Cubans. Um, well, I thought Puerto Ricans were equally as fucking guilty of doing that weird shit. And I know they are because I'm friends with a bunch of Puerto Ricans. Mm -hmm. And I fucking know. Like, I... mm -hmm, Fucking... Anyway, the fact that people openly accept that as a means to abuse a child... Your own child. You're fucking stupid. You're fucking stupid. And all of your relatives should probably be put in a fucking... Put in an asylum because you're all fucking retarded. Get a handle on yourself. God, for fucking that, that no. is That equals mental deficiency. Oh, she's possessed. You better beat her to death. Go so, do some more of your crack cocaine. And you know what? The crack told me. The crack told me that you were possessed. So, Wilda's brother, um, his name was uh, Rafael Nojones, and her sister, Montese- uh, Monserrate Torres. Monserrate. I actually really like that name. Anyway. They said that they believed the tall tales of Elsa's demons, and therefore they never questioned their sister's torment of Elisa. Neighbors oh would God. say they would frequently hear Elisa screaming for help and begging her mother to stop hurting her. We thought it was just her way of disciplining the kids, said their neighbor, Tony. See? Well, fuck you, Tony. Well, that goes back to my... It was the you, 90s. I, I can't with that shit, though. Like, you can't hear a little kid... It's one thing to hear, like... Jeez. Sick. And you hear a little mm-hmm. kid go, ah, and no. help, or no. Past that brief encounter, you need to fucking know that it is not okay. Like, and, and realistically, she's six, bitch. Like, mm-hmm. I, whenever have I had to strike your, your six-year-old? Fucking not, never, not on purpose. Like, I have been playing with her and, like, accidentally elbowed her. And that one time I chased her into the fucking, she tripped and fell and crashed into the fucking uh, TV, TV stand, stand and split her fucking head open. That was that fun. That wasn't that bad, though. No, but it scared the crap out of me. But you can literally look at a small child and be like, hey! Right. If I, I can hurt their feelings with raising my voice. And I because have. Because I don't do it very often. Well, I do now. Like, they're at the point now that they're like, huh, whatever. whatever. They started laughing. So <laughs> I have to, like, pretend like I'm going to do something, and that's enough. Like, and right. if I did swat her on the butt or whatever, she would know. Like, with one little, I wouldn't even have to physically hurt her, just make a little contact. And yep. she would be like, oh, God. Jesus. But I'm I really just her. I really just think that, like, oh, we heard her crying and screaming for help and telling her mom to stop. What the fuck, yo? And you just sat there? Listening from in between the thin walls that separated from you and absolute child abuse? It wasn't a tickle fight. Well, fucking okay. <laughs> okay, I like, guess. If you hear that coming from my house, I'm probably pinning a child down and tickling them to the point of pissing themselves. I, I really just know. have such a difficult time when people are like, well, well, you know, we just thought that fucking, it's how she disciplined her kids. What? No. I don't give a fuck if that is how you dis like somebody that lives by you disciplines their children. It is not normal. It's not okay. You either call the police and you call them until they show up, or if you're angel because you have no boundaries or fucks to give, I would have gone over there and kicked that motherfucker open myself. For real. If I'm laying, if I'm in my house, if I'm in my apartment and I can hear a little girl, a little girl screaming for help, I'm going to go help. I'm mm-hmm. going to get fucked up. I, I just said, like, I'm not going to do anything that, you know, like, threatens my life. I don't want to end up dead. Because that's how you end up dead. That's how you get stabbed and shot and shit. But I feel like I've done enough karate that I might be able to dodge some of that shit, but I can't sit there and listen to a little kid scream like that. Hell no. There's no way. Despite the fact that in addition to having, by this time, born six children... 
three of whom had been born after Elisa, Awilda targeted Elisa for almost all the physical, mental, and emotional abuse she inflicted upon her children. Sounds of Elisa being beaten and otherwise abused later reported, reporting hearing Elisa's repeated pleading with her mother to stop pitting her and stating such pleas as, Mommy, Mommy, please stop. No more. I'm sorry. Some neighbors did report their suspicion of child abuse to welfare authorities. However, no effective action was taken. Other neighbors reportedly knew of the abuse of Elisa and to much lesser degree her siblings endured, but failed to notify authorities. The apartment was a home of horrors, to say the very least. Elisa would be forced to eat her own excrement. Excre- I can't even say excrement. the word excrement because I was being disgusted, but you know what I mean. If you don't stop it. Her head would be used as a mop. She would be beaten with various objects and burnt. And she would be sexually assaulted both anally and vaginally with a hairbrush and toothbrush and forced to drink ammoniated water. Elisa was deprived of food while she, was wa- while she watched her half-siblings chow down on dinner every night. Carlos Lopez, Awilda's husband, would even encourage his own children to hit Elisa. Oh, Carlos Lopez, um, he himself was also uh, regularly using drugs, is also known to have repeatedly physically abused and neglected Alyssa, while her two older siblings, primarily due to the fact that none of the three were his biological children. So um, it was said that he also was cruel to the other ones, like the two older ones, mm-hmm. Casey and Rubencino, Rubencio, um, but that... Alyssa was like, she took the brunt of yeah. the abuse. Much of this abuse took place in the bathroom of the apartment, thus furthering Alyssa's, de- Alyssa's desire to enter any such type of room. A representative from the federally funded parenting program, which had endorsed Awilda's initial motion, initial motion to achieve sole custody of her daughter, also reported that Awilda had herself phoned him complaining that his daughter was unable to control her bladder or bowels and that she had cut off her hair and, um, but that that was because Alyssa did it. Like Alyssa got a hold of scissors or whatever. So I just had to cut the rest off. Or that she was acting out in such a strange way that she was pulling her hair out. So, um, Awilda cut it off to keep her from doing that. And also said that Alyssa was drinking water from the toilet. In response to this phone call from Awilda, the representative did call another representative from the Manhattan Child Welfare Authorities who rebuffed the visits and, well, not the visits, the requests for visits to the Lopez residence. So somebody calls and says, yo, this crazy shit is happening. Somebody needs to go over there and check stuff out. And they were like, pfft. There's nothing wrong. No, she I have, just called and explained it all. It's fine. It was just a misunderstanding. It's Her daughter's possessed by the devil. I don't know what to tell you guys. Um, on November 15th, Carlos Lopez was jailed in relation to a violation of parole. Seven days later, on the evening of November 22nd, Awilda phoned one, phoned one of her sisters, Mercy Torres, to report that Alyssa, finger quotes, okay, this is a direct quote, was like retarded on the bed with fluid later... To Dermot, hold on, words are fun and Angel's mad and sad. She was like retarded on the bed with fluid later determined to be, to be brain fluid leaking from her nose and her mouth. In addition, Lopez informed her sister that Elisa would not eat or drink. When Miss Torres insisted that Awilda take Elisa to the hospital, Awilda replied that she would think about it after she had finished cleaning the dishes. Are you fucking with me i can't this is why like no sweetie you're why like sweetie i say sweetie because i meant that in the most the most derogatory way possible i did your child is not going to eat or drink anything because she's dying you have beaten her to where the fluid that protects her tiny little precious brain is now leaking from her fucking mucous membranes yeah and um so she can't eat like not there are greater, won't. there are greater fucking things afoot. God, I know. The following morning, Awilda contacted a neighbor who, sorry, I can't read, who she invited to view Elissa's lifeless body. Like, oh, will you? Do you want? Hey, do you come? want to take a look at my kid? She's, uh, she's, she's kind of ghost like. Feeling good. She's just laying there. Upon being unable to locate signs of life, this neighbor told Awilda to call the police which she refused to do. In response, the neighbor immediately called the police and an ambulance 
um, as a will that threatened to commit suicide. Alyssa was dead at just six years old. Awilda would eventually confess that she had thrown Alyssa headfirst into a concrete wall two days before the ambulance was called. She revealed that Alyssa hadn't spoken or moved since the incident. Medical examiners were horrified at the sight of little Alyssa and couldn't even begin to imagine the torture she had endured by somebody who was supposed to be her caregiver. Her lifeless body reflected years of abuse. She had numerous injuries, which included broken fingers. One f- one finger bone was even protruding through the skin. That little mm. girl had a compound fracture with a bone poking through her fucking skin. You gotta be mm. shitting me. Mm-hmm. My brother did that. My brother broke his finger, had it smashed in an unstable um, letter on a construction oh, yeah. site. Had his bone poking through the skin. A grown-ass man with a pain threshold of about a 10... Couldn't handle that pain. So, you know, fuck me. Do it to a little girl. And then don't do anything to help her out. Oh, you know. Burns and cuts all over her head, face, body, and internal injuries to her organs. An autopsy also revealed that her genitalia and rectum bore signs of trauma, including tearing. It was shown that all of the injuries had been sustained over a period of time. It was evident that Elissa had been tortured from the moment she entered the apartment. But if that judge, go ahead and give her to the fucking natural mother, whatever the fuck her, yeah, her, you know, her excuse was. Mm-hmm. The abuse surrounding this case is a sh- it's extremely abhorrent, and even more abhorrent is the fact, aberrant, abhorrent, however you want to say it, was that it was easily preventable, and had child services responded accordingly, Elisa never would have been in this position. Mm-mm. Um, Elisa Izquierdo's funeral was held November 29th, 1995. Prior to Elisa's burial, a wake was held. Those present at the wake and the funeral included relatives, neighbors, politicians, Prince Michael of Greece, and members of the public that had been touched by the case. Elisa's casket remained open through the ceremony, and a single red rose was placed in her hand. Her coffin had been adorned with white flowers, and a Barbie doll had been that had been given to Elisa by her father which she, it was known that she cherished and kept this, like this one toy was the one thing that she kept with her, had been placed alongside her body. I got really sad. Mm, I don't like it. Many mourners placed additional toys, flowers, stuffed animals, and notes of sympathy in and upon her coffin prior to the casket being closed and her burial being taken place at Cypress Hill Cemetery. Alyssa's gravestone bears a plaque with the inscription reading, World, please watch over the children. Alyssa was buried in a white coffin so small that there were only room for four pallbearers. At the front was Alyssa's, Alyssa, oh God, Alyssa's aunt, Elsa Canzanaris, Gustavo's cust- cousin who had fought for custody. Snow blanketed the ground on the Cypress Hill Cemetery where she was buried following the somber funeral at Ponce Funeral Home in Bushwick, Bro- Brooklyn. As the dainty coffin was lowered into the ground, mourners threw pink carnations. Elsa was buried in a white lace dress that draped over her thin and frail body. On her head, she wore a garland made of white flowers that couldn't quite conceal the bruises on her temple, a grim reminder of the abuse she had sustained before her death. During her funeral, the Reverend Gianni Agostinelli, Agostinelli, Mm-hmm. Once I sounded it out, I was like, I think I can say this. <laughs> Who informed the estimated 300 mourners in attendance that Elisa had been murdered not only by her own mother, but by the silence of many, by the neglect of child welf- welfare institutions and the, mo- Jesus. and the moral mediocrity that has intoxicated our neighborhoods. That was a quote of what he said. The Daily News wrote in their front page editorial, Eliza Izquierdo, sorry, Izquierdo, Izquierdo is finally at peace. May her mother never find a moment of it again. God, amen. I agree with that 100%. In June of 1996, Awilda Lopez pleaded guilty to murder after maintaining her innocence for months. In a hearing held before Judge Alvin Schlesinger, Schlesinger, at the New York State Supreme Court. She cried during the court proceeding before finally admitting that she had thrown Elisa at the wall. This is a quote. Elisa languished unconscious in the apartment until the next day 
with brain fluid leaking from an ear, said Assistant Manhattan District Attorney Donna Hankin. According to Awilda's lawyer, she was horrified by her own actions. Somehow I highly fucking I it. don't think she was. I think that she was acting that way for the courts. Yeah, I just don't buy that. Mm-mm. Sorry. Not sorry. Upon the advice of her attorney, Daniel Olin, Lopez pleaded guilty to this deal, offend- offered, offended, <laughs> fuck you, get your mouth together. Come on, mouth. We got work to do. Mouth, get together. <clears throat> offered by the prosecution team with the knowledge she would become eligible for parole after serving 15 years imprisonment. Prosecutors had agreed to a Wilda's plea to spare her two surviving children the trauma of reliving Elisa's death at the trial. Prior to formal sentencing, Judge Schlesinger openly criticized the child welfare, welfare system within New York, stating, We have not created procedures to do everything necessary to protect the young and vulnerable in this society. The system has failed to protect our babies. And don't tell me how much it costs. If anything is to become of this horrendous tragedy, then it will be that we give priority to these babies. Mm-hmm. Awilda was sentenced 15 years to life, where she has received all the protections of the legal system. The same, very same system that failed to save Elisa. The tragic life and death of Elisa Iscadero became a symbol of the failures in New York's Child Welfare Administration and Family Court, whose bureaucracy allowed this little girl to slip right through the cracks and into her grave. The story became a national disgrace, and lawyers would cite the case as an example chronic and systematic problem. By 1996, Mayor Giuliani declared that he would abolish the city's Child Welfare Administration and rebuild it from top to bottom. Yay. He also signed Alyssa's law into legislation, which was designed to balance the need for increased accountability through public awareness and government oversight and pushed for an urgent review of the city's welfare system. This review inspired the creation of the Administration for Children's Services, an agency solely devoted to the issue of child welfare in New York. On February 12, 1996, Governor George Pataki formally signed Alyssa's law into legislation. This legislation, named named in Alyssa's honor, was signed into law uh, in the presence of several relatives of Elisa, plus numerous social workers and school teachers who had attempted to intervene and or inform child welfare authorities in their collective efforts to prevent the child being with or remaining in the awarded custody of her mother. Elisa's law, designed to balance the need for increased accountability through public awareness and government oversight with the privacy interests of individuals involved in child protective services cases, particularly with regards to the deaths of children previously reported to the child welfare services as suffering any form of neglect or abuse. All reports pertaining to the deaths of the children resulting in, nope, resulting from child abuse available for public scrutiny do not name the actual deceased child or children, or the actual case workers assigned to investigate reports of suspected child abuse or neglect relating to the deceased child or children in question. However, these reports do list each and every complaint and or report submitted relating to the child or children and the agency's actual response. In addition, these public records contained an assessment detailing whether or not the agency's overall response had been adequate. Elisa's law, I just fucking inhaled so sharply, I almost choked. (laughs) (laughs) Well, all right. Elisa's law continues to hold the Child Welfare Agency of New York City and the Administration for Children's Services, the ACS, publicly accountable for its performance. Although Awilda initially became eligible for parole in 2010, she has remained incarcerated since 96. Lopez was most recently denied parole in 2018. Her next scheduled parole hearing is in 2020. As of 2019, she remains incarcerated at the maximum. Maximum. It sounded like Popeye. The maximum. It's the maximum. (laughs) Jesus. It's slowly the maximum. (laughs) The maximum security Bedford Bedford Hills Correctional Facility for Women. On On the 29th of October, 1996, Elisa's stepfather... 
Carlos Lopez was sentenced to serve between one and a half and three years in prison to run consecutive with the sentence he was serving at the time of Elisa's death. This sentence was in relation to one specific instance of physical abuse dating from the 31st of October in 1995, in which he had repeatedly banged Alyssa's head against a concrete wall in the presence of her siblings. Jesus. God, I can't... People are fucking horrible, dude. Mm -hmm. Although Carlos Lopez pleaded guilty to this charge of attempted second-degree assault, claiming that he had not actually assaulted Alyssa, but had opted to do so to spare his children the emotional trauma of having to testify against him, Judge Schlesinger rejected his claim outright, outright, adding that the prosecution team had largely chosen to charge Carlos Lopez with the charge to spare Alyssa's siblings any further psychological or emotional trauma. The public outrage at Alyssa's death was fueled by revelations that despite Abuela Lopez's evident and spiraling drug addiction and the obvious and increasing signs of ongoing physical, mental, and emotional abuse Alyssa was suffering at the hands of her mother and stepfather, not only had a judge awarded custody of the child to her mother in 1994 in spite of protestations from her family and school, but numerous instances of concerns for Alyssa's safety reported to child welfare agencies such as the Manhattan Child Welfare Authorities by various individuals since that date had ultimately failed to remove Alyssa from custody of her mother. Following Elisa's death and subsequent public funeral, her life story became the subject of numerous local and national media articles. From the local tabloids, such as New York Daily News and the New York Post, her story had also been given the front page of the December 11, 1995 edition of Time magazine under the title A Shameful Death. Alyssa's story was also featured on the August 1996 episode of Dateline NBC. Much of the media coverage devoted to this case was openly openly scathing of New York's child welfare agencies. Following Elisa's death, Judge Greenbaum was subjected to even more severe criticism regarding her 1994 decision to award Elisa to Awilda as opposed to Elsa Canzanares. Judge Greenbaum responded to this criticism by claiming that she had merely been following the procedural recommendations when she made her custodial decision. Um, In response to Greenbaum's claim, the then mayor of New York City, Rudolph Giuliani, had a statement to make to the media. The judge ultimately makes the decision based on the facts and the records and is supposed to go behind those things to make the determinations. Elisa Iscadero's five siblings were raised in separate foster homes, reportedly all suffered acute psychological trauma due to the acts of extreme physical and mental cruelty that they had been forced to witness um, that had been inflicted upon their sister. These are drawn from Time Magazine and the New York Times. There was also a television talk show. Uh, I talked about her briefly in the beginning of this episode. Her name is Rolanda Watts. Um, Conducted an interview with Awilda prior to her June 1996 sentencing as part of her Rolanda daytime talk show series, which I watched a lot as a youngster. Commissioned by King World Productions, this interview was incorporated into a 45-minute episode titled Lost Little Girl, The Life and Death of Elisa. Elisa is Cadero. The broadcast was initially done in 1996, um, April 1996. You can find these on YouTube. Now, if you guys choose to go and watch the same interviews on YouTube, brace yourself for teeth grinding and anger because her mother is a totally fucking disgusting, reprehensible piece of shit. She's obnoxious, she's ignorant, and she ought to be on death fucking row. Um, She has no remorse, none. She takes no accountability for her actions. She maintains that she is not the person who burned and severely injured Elisa. And it took me over two days, 48 hours. Do you know how many minutes are in 48 hours? More than 60. Yes. And that's all the amount of footage that was there because I was sick to my stomach and I was so fucking furious with some of the things that her mother said. Um, I struggle with people that are loud and obnoxious and ignorant. It's one thing to be loud and obnoxious, but when you add a facet of fucking ignorance to it, I immediately become like irrationally angry. Mm -hmm. I don't do well with stupid people. Mm -mm. Um, And not like when I say stupid people, it's people that openly act um, without regard. You know what I mean? 
And it's, I, I just, I struggle with fucking stupid people. Yeah. Her mother is a typical fucking scumbag with the, I'm the victim here mentality. No, you're not, bitch. That, I am not you... fucking kidding. So I can't remember if it's part two or three. Cause it's like, I want, it might be, I, I think it actually, it's more than that. But the clips are done in like eight minute to nine minute like pieces. So there, I think there's actually five or six of them, but I want to say it's in part two or three. She literally fucking drops. I'm the victim here. And I had to pause it. Okay. I paused it and I got up and I fucking walked away and I caught myself slamming doors and like kicking shit out of my way. And I just, I'm the victim here. In what way? Tell me, will you please elaborate on how you're the fucking victim because you killed your six-year-old child? It is mind-numbing the way that she speaks and the way that she says things. It turns off any... um, Any ability to for me to listen clearly and gather information that might be useful goes away. Mm-hmm. I don't have the ability to be even sympathetic to any portion of this woman. And it, it's difficult for me to try to be sympathetic in the first fucking place. Yeah. But then when you sit down and you say things like, well, are you going to let me talk? What about my side of the story? What about your fucking side of the story? You loud mouth pig face piece of shit. What do you add? What could you add to the fact that you threw your kid up against the wall and killed her? What? Please tell me anything. I, I, so anyway, that being said, you, bitch. You, you fucking gutter cunt. I, yeah. I really struggled. So I did get through all, all of the parts. I didn't even try after I read that part where you're like, it took me, I'm like, nope, fuck this. Nope. I, I watched them because that's what good research and reporting mm-hmm. is. You read and you watch and you, you do gather all everything. all the things from all the places. Yes. And even though you don't want to, you do. I did not want to. You already did. I mean. You're like, oh, you did it. Fuck you. You, you didn't did have a good it. time doing it. So I'm not going to. Um, and, and honestly, I uh, I wish that I hadn't just because there wasn't information that was worth gathering there. Uh, less the part that I love Rolanda. I, I, I super duper love Rolanda. Um, and I you, I was enamored with her as a, yeah. as a young girl. Um you know, she's just really beautiful black woman. And I just, her style was, um, she called people on their shit Mm -hmm. and she wasn't, um, she wasn't gentle about it. You know, she wasn't aggressive. She wasn't aggressive. She wasn't passive. She was very assertive. Assertive. She was assertive in her reporting. And I just thought that Rolanda kind of hung the moon when I was, you know, 1996, I was in junior high and the way that she, she also taught me this. Oh. When she would like, ah, and like snap her nails. I hate it when certain people do that. But when Rolanda does it and she holds her hand up and goes, no. You like clap. Yeah. And, yes. Mm. I'm like, fuck yeah. Tell that bitch. Anyway, <laughs> uh, you can go and check out um, if any of you are interested. I did include some information on where she is held. Um, and if you want to uh, send her mail, I have that. I highly recommend sending her the mail. Um, also, you can go um, check this out. It's uh, We'll throw this in like the show notes, but it's letters to the parole board. Um, since she is coming up for parole in 2020, um, I've already written my letter to the parole board um, as, a, as a mother. I just think that this person should probably stay right where she is forever. Um, but I'll, I'll make this shit available to you guys. Um, if you are interested, um, and are wanting to send a letter to the parole board, um, because that is coming up in a few short months. Gag. I know. So, you know what guys, until next time, if you see it, hear it, suspect it, call the fucking cops and do not let people hurt children. Mm-hmm. Do fucking not. Mm-hmm. And, uh, stay, stay out, out of chalk, chalk lines. lines. Goodbye. Goodbye.